Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Washington. Outside the video today, as usual, is the editor in chief. That's me, Irina Zuckerman. And today's uh, um, guest is Maxime Ogwen, historian, who will talk about us about uh, um, the Montreux Convention and its history. Um, uh, the Montreux Convention came into uh, public discussion as a result of the uh, recent decision by Turkey to close uh, entry to Bosporus to Russian warships. However, the discussion about the legal diplomatic issues behind uh, their decision to do so have been, uh, has been at the forefront of Turkey's concerns for before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this has been uh, discussed by maritime security specialists and it's, uh, Turkey has been pushing for revisions and updates to uh, agreements, historic agreements that have uh, uh, turned the, the situation uh, uh, into what it is now. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, all of this today. Uh, first, Maxim will give us um, a historical perspective on these events and then we'll have a discussion uh, on how that affects current events and current interests of Turkey and other geopolitical actors. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Irina. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to all those who are listening us right now. So this is typically an issue where we can see long-term tendency and where historical concern, is concerns of the past have echoes today in spite of differences. So. I will speak about the historical background until the Lausanne Treaty and Convention, about the solution that was tried in Lausanne itself in 1823, about the Montreux Convention itself, why and how we arrived at such a convention, and I will finish with the last major crisis of late 1930s and 1940s and the stabilization of the situation after that. So, in modern history, the turning point is the Kuchuk Kainarja Treaty of 1774 after an Ottoman defeat against Russia. Because after that, uh, the Black Sea is not an Ottoman lake anymore. And this is the real beginning of the uh, Russian push, the, the Russian thrust towards the Free Seas so with the conquest of Crimea, which is uh, on the front light of uh, the news today. And Russia obtains the rights to navigate for the, its ships to navigate on the Black Sea and to pass the strait. As early as the end of 18th century, the issue begins. The next step is the British intervention as a result of that. In 1809, uh, London imposed the Dardanelles Treaty, and this treaty closed the straits to all warship. It is modified by the London Conventions of 1840 and 1841. There are two conventions because the French intervened. I will skip these details. And briefly, this convention say uh, the Ottoman Empire has the right to close the straits to warships in wartime and in peacetime. So this is a constant British policy in 19th century to close the straits as much as possible to uh, the Russian uh, warships to prevent this uh, Russian push towards the Free Sea and especially to the Mediterranean Sea. It is also to be understood in the context of British Turcophilia uh, during the three first quarter of the 19th century, especially inside the British Conservative Party, the uh, archetypal figure being, of course, uh, Benjamin Disraeli. And the culmination of that is the neutralization of the Black Sea itself uh, in 1856, after the Crimean War that opposed France, Britain, uh, the future Kingdom of Italy, the Ottoman Empire to Russia, and after the humiliating uh, Russian defeats uh, for 14 years, the Black Sea is neutralized. Al always this policy to push Russia as much as possible in the north. Uh, it's Russia denounced that uh, unilaterally in 1870 as a result of the French defeat. I skip the details, but just know that there was even this attempt of neutralization. This uh, long trend uh, begins to change with the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907, 
when uh, the preservation of the Ottoman Empire stops being a priority for British diplomacy, with the Italo-Turkish War of 1911 and uh, its immediate consequence, uh, namely that the conquest of the Strait, the direct control of the Strait, becomes a priority of the Russian policy, which is one of the main reasons for the First World War, actually. This First World War, of course, uh, changed the issue of the Strait. I cannot go into the details. The Bolshevik Revolution changed the situation for uh, almost a century. And this period, until the beginning of 1920s, is a period of attempt of direct control by Russia, by uh, attempt to invade the Ottoman Empire purely and simply, or for Britain by proxy in using Greece to control this. And precisely, uh, the defeat of this policy uh, leads us to Lausanne after the crushing victory of Turkey against Greece. The main goal of the British delegation at Lausanne in 1922-1923, which was led by Lord Curzon, is a demilitarization of the Straits, so an opening of the Strait. Why? To be able to enter the Black Sea if necessary and to destroy the Soviet fleet in case of a war. So this is exactly the opposite of what Britain had tried in 19th century to close. It is also in the context of rivalry with Russia, but a completely different strategy, the opposite. And actually, uh, the supreme irony is that the Soviets advocate what Britain had advocated in 19th century. They advocate a complete closing of the Straits to any uh, alien uh, warships. For, this, for the same reason, but the opposite perspective. This is not that Russia, Soviet Russia and Britain absolutely wanted to go to war, far from that, but both understood that it could happen one day, so let's try something to uh, start the war in the best con possible conditions. The French delegation uh, at Lausanne wanted to reach a compromise, to uh, have a compromise between Britain and Turkey, which were both uh, important for France, especially at that time and to prevent a repetition of 1914, namely a closing of the Straits against the French interest. So the compromise uh, that was formed in Lausanne is the following. The Marmara Sea is excluded from the Strait zone, so the Turkey can do whatever she wants uh, on the shores of the Marmara Sea. At the request of Britain, there is no fortification on the Strait Sea itself, so Bosphorus and uh, Janakale, the Dardanelles. The Turks only have the right to uh, maintain 12,000 soldiers on the Bosphorus. And no right for Turkey to close the straits to military ships as long as Turkey is not part of a war. And you will see it is a, the main difference with the Montreux Convention 13 years later. There are also uh, regulations that are still valid today. Uh, no foreign uh, warship uh, may stay in the strait zone, except if this ship has to be repaired. Of course, it always may happen. You cannot leave a, a damaged ship in the middle of the Bosphorus. And uh, there's also an article uh, in the Lausanne Convention. I say the Lausanne Convention because it is an appendix to uh, the Lausanne Treaty itself. I, I'm skipping the details. And the Lausanne Convention says that uh, no fleet uh, bypassing the biggest fleet of the uh, countries bordering the Black Sea uh, can pass the, st the Straits to maintain a kind of balance and to uh, preserve this kind of balance and to avoid the possibility of a war. A commission of the Straits uh, is created, but at the request of Turkey, it is just an institution to inform the League of Nations, the ancestor of the United Nations, it has no real authority. The Turks did not want it because they, want to, they wanted to keep their sovereignty as much as possible. To a large extent, they succeeded. The counterpart of all that is uh, because Turkey could not defend the Strait as much as uh, the Turks wanted. Uh, sanctions are explicitly uh, mentioned in the convention. So if any state takes profit of this absence of fortification, uh, sanction will be taken uh, in the context of the League of Nations and especially by France, United Kingdom, Italy and Japan, which are the main power guaranteeing the freedom of the Strait and the integrity of Turkey in this regard. 
this is the situation of 1923, which is actually uh, very uh, coherent with the context of 1920s of disarmament, peace by law, etc. But unfortunately, the, as you know, the context changed. That's why uh, the Montreux Convention was signed actually. Briefly, uh, what do I mean by the change of context? Uh, the bilateral context first. Italy uh, had supported the Turks during the Turkish War of Independence, but no, Italy is fascist, is increasingly fascist, and is increasingly aggressive, including as far as Turkey is concerned. Mussolini wanted to take, if possible, southwestern Anatolia. And before doing that, uh, is establishing fortification on the Wards Island, right in front of Turkey, because Wards was an Italian colony at that time. Hitler arrives in power in 1933. He denounces the Versailles Treaty in 1935, and so on. And of course, there is a fascist invasion of Ethiopia in 1935 which is very badly perceived in Turkey for ethical reasons and also because fascist Italy is threatening and very badly perceived in Britain for ethical reasons and also because one of the two sources of the Nile are in Ethiopia. So there is a rapprochement between Britain and Turkey against the ambition of fascist Italy. That's why as early as April 1935, uh, Turkey asked for a revision of the Lausanne Convention and the uh, Ethiopian war in 1935-36 accelerates uh, this process. And Turkey insists in April 1936 by an official, a new official note, the context is not the context of 1923 anymore. We need a new convention and Britain accept, France accept, and so on. Remarkably, fascist Italy does not want to be part of the new convention which is, I think, self-explanatory. As a result of that, it takes only one month, June, July uh, 1936, to sign a new regulation for the streets. There are no big disagreements except with the Soviets because uh, France, UK, and Turkey agree against the Soviet thesis. And the Soviet thesis, no, it is the full liberty of circulation the Soviet strategy has changed. No, they would like to uh, pass uh, the straits in case of a war. And they use an argument, which is still the argument of Russia today, actually. Uh, the Soviet Union is bordered by seas, which are not connected. They are bordered by the Black Sea. They are bordered by the Arctic Seas. And it's difficult to, for the Soviet Navy to connect. Uh, Greece and other countries support the Turkish thesis, uh, especially because Greece and Turkey have uh, a, the climax of the Greek-Turkish rapprochement in the 1930s. So what do the uh, Montreux Convention, does the Montreux Convention say briefly? It confirms the freedom of circulation in peacetime, the freedom of circulation for the uh, civilian ships, but it imposes some limitation. For example, uh, uh, 15,000 tons for the wall transiting uh, alien naval forces. No country except Turkey, of course, can pass more than 15,000 tons at the same moment. Countries bordering the Black Sea can pass more than that, but uh, they have to pass the main ships one by one. So in practice, there is never more or than 15,000 ships or a huge ship in the street in one time, always to avoid any attempt to take the straits and as a pretext of passing ships. But the most important for today is uh, Article 19. Unlike the Lausanne Convention, it gives the rights to Turkey to close the straits to military ships without being part of a war. According to the Article 19, Turkey is allowed to say there is a war concerning the Black Sea regions. So I'm closing the straits to any warships of the belligerents. And there is an exception uh, to this rule. If Turkey has signed a pact of mutual assistance with a country, Turkey may say, uh, as I am the ally of this country and as this country has been assaulted, I am closing the 
to aid to the military ships of the country which is attacking, and I am allowing the ships of the country which is attacked to pass the straits. This is a compromise uh, that was found at that time. Uh, regarding the trade ships, nothing is changed. It's always a freedom of pass to pass that is maintained. And um, one more time, like the Lausanne Convention, uh, a warship has no right to uh, stay in the strait except to be uh, repaired. There are also some other uh, technical uh, aspects that we can discuss that uh, later. And also, Turkey obtains the suppression of the commission of the straits, purely and simply, to reaffirm its own. And uh, last but not least, Turkey can put all the fortifications she wants on the straits uh, region and all the military uh, presence she wants. This is the regulation until today. But I think it's uh, not unnecessary to remind that there were uh, two main attempts uh, to revise the Montreux Convention drastically. As early as the end of 1936, this is the beginning of the rapprochement between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, preparing the Non-Aggression Pact of August and the Alliance Pact of September 1939. In 1937, the Soviet ambassador is recalled in Moscow and killed in the context of the purge. The same year, Turkey closed its consulate in the Soviet Union, uh, cooling of the relation uh, with Soviet Union. And then in October 1939, Turkey signs an alliance with Britain and France. Immediately after, Soviet Union tries to uh, empty this treaty from any substance, because Soviet Union is on the side of Nazi Germany. And the Soviet Union also asked Turkey for a naval base on the Straits and a drastic revision of the Montreux Convention at the benefit of the Soviet Union, of course. Turkey refuses persistently. The Soviet Union insists, Stalin insists. Uh, in November 1940, he asked a joint initiative of Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Soviet Union to obtain that. But of course, Hitler is already thinking about invading uh, the Soviet Union, so it just keeps silent, postponed indefinitely. And one more time, Stalin insists in March 1945, denouncing the uh, Friendship Treaty signed with Turkey in 1921 and asking for cars, Ardan, this is in Eastern Anatolia, I'm skipping that, and several land and naval bases on the streets. This is uh, pure imperialism. Fortunately for Turkey, uh, Franklin Roosevelt died just after that. And Harry Truman is, uh, understands much more the danger of uh, Soviet expansionism and gradually uh, comes close to the Turkish position in three steps. I'm skipping the details. But eventually, Truman gives the US guarantee to Turkey, which stops the Soviet ambitions, and in 1952, Turkey becomes a member of NATO, and the regional command of Southeastern Europe is now located in Izmir. So the guarantee is not uh, verbal, it's a very practical guarantee, and that's why the Montreux Convention remain uh, intact for decades uh, until today. So that's a fascinating perspective, which actually <laughs> raises a lot of questions. Before we get yeah. into more contemporary applications of what no. that means, and as a reminder, Turkey did sign um, a treaty with uh, an agreement with the Ukraine shortly before the invasion occurred, yes. which many people may not have caught, but it's an important development that explains uh, yes. what's happening. Uh, let's go back. To so some of the points you mentioned in history, in particular, the beginning of World War One and uh, why one of the reasons for that was this control over these traits, which is not often discussed in the United States, unfortunately, yes. as in the context of the imperialist ambitions of different countries, it's almost forgotten other than in specialist um, courses. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, first of all, I recommend uh, the reading of Sean McMeekin's 
the book, The Russian Origins of the First World War, which was published by Harvard University Press a bit more than 10 years ago in 2011, which is the most detailed study of uh, this aspect of the issue. So uh, to summarize his findings and the findings of other historians, uh, after Italy attacked uh, the Ottoman Empire and started with difficulties actually to take Libya to the Ottoman Empire, and even more after the Balkan coalition uh, won a kind of blitzkrieg against the Ottoman Empire, Russia uh, started thinking that it was time to destroy the Ottoman Empire purely and simply. And for Russia, the most important was to take the control of the Straits. This is something that was dreamed by the Tsars since 18th century. But for plenty of reasons, it was not possible. But no, the Russian state uh, thought this is the right moment. But and of course, and of course, with the question of the uh, rivalry with other powers for other reasons, but they said a war uh, may start soon. Uh, we have neutralized Britain because Britain, after the agreement of 1907, stopped considering the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire as a priority. And France still considers it as a priority, but if, if Germany attacks France, which is actually what will happen, Mm -hmm. uh, France will need Britain and Russia, and this is exactly what happened. Uh, if you read the uh, French diplomatic correspondence, in 1914, 1915, they desperately tried to convince Russia uh, not to occupy the Straits, but eventually they had to accept that, because they cannot defeat Germany alone, purely and simply. So this was one of those compromises that you know, you had to take on the ally as it is, despite other complications. Yes. Uh, so what exactly was the Russia, Russian Empire's motivation to destroy the Ottomans? What bothered them so much? Uh, uh, the main reason uh, was uh, the Ottoman Empire was an obstacle between continental Russia and the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was both for military strategic and economic reasons, because at that time, the Russian Empire was the main exporter of corns, of cereals, but 90% passed by the Bosphorus and, and the Dardanelles, of course, by the streets. So it was a problem for them to say uh, one of our main export is controlled in practice by a foreign power. So it's the culmination, in a sense, of the Russian push to the Free Seas. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, it's not a coincidence if this uh, climax of Russian imperialism at that time coincide with the occupation of northern Iran. I was going to actually literally mention that right there. Because, Ex exa exa because exactly we are seeing of some of the same dynamic playing out today unbeknownst to some of the Gulf states who may not be necessarily, you know, thinking about that history, and yet here we are. Ex ex exactly. So this is also a moment when uh, Russia occupies the northern Iran. And similarly, in 1945, when Stalin denounced the treaty, claims bases on the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, etc., he, he also occupies a part of Iran because uh, Iran the Shah of Iran uh, tried to join Nazi Germany, so both Britain and Soviet Union invaded this country in 1941, which is logical consequence of the Second World War. But Stalin does not do that only. In 1945-46, he supports uh, Azeri and Kurdish separatism in Iran to have puppet regimes and to reach the Gulf. And in 1945, Stalin also uh, claims the Western trace for Bulgaria against Greece, not because he has an unconditional love for Bulgarians, but because Bulgaria is becoming communist and Greece is not becoming communist. So this is always both in uh, before and during the First World War and in 1946-47, a, a part of a more general shame to which the free seals. So we are seeing this continuity of policy despite widely divergent ideologies from monarchist, you know, Russian Empire to yes. the communist Soviet Union. We are seeing some of the same rivalries continuing over Libya and, uh, you know, in Africa and uh, 
other territories and Russia's ambitions and interest in uh, navigations of the sea. At the time, arguably, the, the diplomatic situation was a little bit different with the empires. There was a there was a legitimate concern about being able to traverse the waters, but with the development of the international agreements and treaties, that was no longer such a big concern. And yet we see that under Stalin, a more Russia continued, the Soviet Union continued kind of a more aggressive position. Yes. So what exactly prevented the Soviet Union from developing a, a more flexible kind of arrangement was it just the need to export the revolution that prevented them from coming to normal diplomatic arrangements or was there another other factors involved i know. i think uh, we must distinguish according to the periods uh, if we look at the leninist period which was a relatively short period actually this is the most ideological uh, I am not an apologist of Lenin, far from that, but he was the most sincere with all the cruel methods we all know, but he was the most sincere about exporting the revolution, the global revolution. That was his mind. But the thing is, he was he started the revolution in Russia with the geography of Russia. Mm -hmm. Stalin had a more Russian nationalist perspective, a more Russian imperialist perspective. He uh, accepted the legacy of the Tsars as far as foreign policy was concerned more clearly, more consciously. And also, uh, at the end of the Second World War, and actually until his death, Stalin was deeply convinced that democracies were weak, that the elimination of the fascist regime was a golden opportunity to enlarge Russia as much as possible. And of course, of course, like they need to export revolution, but first of all, to enlarge the Soviet Union, I said Russia, because in a sense it was it was it still was Russia uh, as 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 much as possible. Uh, Ubris of Stalin uh, from the end of the Second World War to his death. Uh, it was true for the Straits. It was true for Iran. It was true for uh, Eastern Europe, and it was true even in the sense that in 1952-53 he was close to launch a world war. Uh, he had a military budget, especially for bombing uh, planes, nuclear bombers, which was completely unusual, to say the very least, in peacetime. So this is uh, this specific context of the post-Second uh, World War and the specific psychology of Stalin. After the death of Stalin, uh, which the Soviet Union was somewhat more prudent, somewhat more concerned about the risk that democracy could uh, destroy Russia with nuclear weapons. That the democracies are not as weak as Stalin thought. What caused Stalin to focus on the northern uh, Iran occupation and trying to access the Gulf through that, as opposed to trying to go after Turkey again? This time, you know, Turkey as Turkey and not as the Ottoman Empire. Can you repeat your question, please? Why, why did why did the Soviet Union go after northern Iran and the att attempts to reach the Gulf as opposed to focusing on kind of uh, finishing going after Turkey, which was you know emerging as a new republic and and so on and so forth? What may what was the calculation being made? Why did they not focus on Turkey again, but and on the relitigating that conflict, but okay. uh, went into northern Iran at the time? Okay, I understand your question. Precisely uh, for the same reason that I just mentioned, precisely because Stalin thought this is the right moment. This is the right moment. This is, we just crushed Nazi Germany. We just have a huge Soviet army. Uh, to, um, Roosevelt is still alive, and was still, Roosevelt was extremely naive regarding the Soviet ambitions, extremely naive towards the personality of Stalin. And uh, Churchill could not do anything could not do everything alone. So he thought it was, and he thought it was a time for a global strategy to reach the three seas, the Mediterranean Sea, of course, but also the Gulf, the Gulf because of oil, of course. So we are seeing the same kind of pattern going on with the Russia looking for particular, not just for access, but for, for control. There is for control, yes. When I, say, when I say access, it, it, it means control, uh, at least uh, 
before and during the First World War and during Stalin's times, yes, of course. Uh, the reason I'm making a distinction be between those two words, because there is a difference between a defensive and, you know, appropriate need to have free navigation, as yes. any country should, and having economic priorities and so forth with a potential monopoly on access by, by a power versus wanting to, to be the one monopolizing that, that access, which is what we are seeing. Now, going back to the Soviet-Turkey relations, we saw that there was a period of time when those relations were at their peak before cooling off and, and culminating in Turkey eventually joining NATO. Could you explain the dynamics behind those chains of events? Why exactly uh, the two countries first thought they could make it work and then went in, in the completely polar opposite directions? I don't know. There, there are uh, small things. Uh, the, can I say, uh, at the end of Lenin's period and during the first years of the Stalin's period, Soviet Union was uh, ravaged by the civil war and was beginning for becoming a normal country. It took years to recover from the uh, civil war, to be accepted as a member of the League of Nations and so on. But in the second half of 1930s, Stalin, one more time, was thinking that democracies are weak, democracies are doomed to fail. And as he feared Hitler a lot, he started thinking, why should we not try to make an arrangement with Hitler? And Turkey was at a completely opposite view to secure a, partnership and later an alliance with France and Britain against the fascist Italy and their Germany ambitions. Turkey did not want to antagonize Soviet Union because of the recollections of the past, but if Soviet Union became aggressive, Turkey could not force Stalin to change his mind. And the culmination of all that was when uh, Turkey signed an alliance pact with uh, France and Britain in October 1939, right after Stalin had signed an alliance with Nazi Germany. So uh, too often people neglect uh, the real beginning of this issue, which is late of 1930s. It did not emerge in 1945. What Stalin does in 1945 is exactly the same that late 1930s. The, the difference is in 1945, Soviet Union is much stronger military in terms of military, and Soviet Union uh, is not anymore the ally of Hitler. Soviet Union is a winner of Hitler. So the image, especially in the American public opinion of Soviet Union is completely different in 1945 and in late 1930s. So the, the, these, are the, these, are, these are the trends. Uh, and also uh, Turkey was re resilient in 1945-46 after the Truman guarantee. Of course, it became much safer, but in 1945-46, they uh, insist as much as possible on their sovereignty and saying, no, uh, we will not antagonize you, but we will not give you our land, we will not give you cars, and you have no right to uh, put uh, Soviet facilities in uh, the streets. It's our territory. We are not asking you for uh, Turkish bases in Crimea. Was there a particular concern that the Soviet Union following World War II could potentially try to re to invade or otherwise uh, take control of the streets? Uh, there are uh, two uh, very different periods. The period when the Soviet Union was the ally of Nazi Germany uh, and uh, tried to use this alliance to obtain from Hitler, as I said, the joint initiative to pressure Turkey so much by the threat of war that Turkey could not resist uh, the acceptance of most of Stalin's demands but Hitler did not want to give such a huge um, advantage to Stalin because Hitler had signed the pact only to destroy France and Britain and then to destroy Soviet Union, not for a long-term alliance with Stalin. And the second period that starts even before 1945, uh, roughly 1944, when the defeat of uh, Nazi Germany on the Eastern Front was crushing and completely obvious, the campaign of Soviet Union against Turkey in the press started. And also there was something more pervert and more subtle. Uh, for example, this is explained by Rodima Sigli, who was a French ambassador in Ankara uh, in 1939-1914. 
he said, uh, had Turkey joined the Second World War in 1944, at the first difficulty, or actually without even a pretext, Russia would have arrived in the Straits to say, oh, we are going to help you in the brotherhood against fascists. Mm -hmm. And of course, they will have stayed. They will have maintained these military facilities in the Straits. Uh, that's why Ismet Inouye did not want to uh, join the Second World War in 1944. He did not fear retaliation from Nazi Germany anymore, but he feared uh, the brotherhood of uh, Stalin's. So we see again a familiar pattern of supposed, you know, supposedly benign officers that then turned into uh, <laughs> an attempt to yeah. occupy or otherwise dominate. Exactly. So we are seeing these interesting developments. Meanwhile, going back to the Montreal Convention, you wanted to do, to address some of these uh, details. Um, yes. In a little bit more highlight. So let's 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 go back to to that. Sure. Uh, you you were mentioning that overall uh, there was an exception uh, that Turkey was uh, could uh, could apply the convention to one party only in the event that they had yes. a, uh, uh, an agreement, a mutual defense treaty yes. with that party. Yes. Prior yes. to this current event, how has the Montreal been traditionally? applied has it ever been really applied uh, as far as i know this is the first time uh, since the second world war that turkey is in a position to say i consider a neighboring state uh, as attack another one and i have a pact with one of the two parties and this part and the pact was signed with the country which is attacked as far I don't know a precedent, uh, anything similar since the Second World War to what is happening today. So that's why, legally speaking and historically speaking, it's particularly interesting and because it is an unprecedented uh, in a sense. Now, in the last couple of years leading up to this particular chain of events, Turkey has expressed repeated interest and push to kind of re negotiate the agreements uh, that led up to uh, its current position with respect to the Straits. What exactly was it trying to change and why? Uh, as far as I know, the main uh, issue was the ambition to uh, create a canal parallel to the Bosphorus. Mm -hmm. And the official position of Turkey was if we do that, the Montreux Convention will not be uh, valuable for this canal. And I think uh, one of the main reasons is an economic and even financial reasons, because this canal, if it is completed, will be extremely expensive. And according to the Montreal Convention, like the Lausanne Convention, Turkey has no right to uh, raise any tax on the pass of trade ships. And the idea is to uh, pay to compensate the cost of the canal in telling if you pass by the canal, you will, you will pay. I think as I, I did not study the issue in, in detail, but I think one of the main reasons is, finan is, is, is financial, the cost of uh, making such a canal parallel to the Bosphorus. But did the Montreux Convention prevent Turkey from creating artificial bodies of water? Uh, there is a huge controversy between uh, international jurists, and as I am not a professor of international law, I will not decide, <laughs> I will not present you, uh, but true, the, there is a significant part of the jurist opinion, which is uh, the Montreal Convention prevents in practice Turkey to do that, at least by itself. If the other signatories of the Montreal Convention tells Turkey, okay, you can do that, uh, this is in conformity with the Montreal Convention, but as long as the other signatories did not say that to Turkey, there is a part of the jurists who say uh, Turkey should not be uh, allowed to do that. That's the different opinions I am presenting. I am not uh, deciding. And of course, the other signatories were not amenable to that happening, correct? Uh, so there is a car that passed. I did not hear you. Uh, the other signat signatories have so far not been amenable to that. Uh, yes, yes. 
Okay, so that kind of brings us to the kind con of contemporary context of this Montreal Convention. So here's an interesting chain of events. Turkey and Ukraine signed this mutual defense agreement shortly uh, yes. before Russia's invasion. Now, yes. at this time, the US government and multiple other countries are telling the international community mm -hmm. that while Putin is expected to invade, you know, they're not going to take any action. Uh, at the same time, nobody has taken note of the fact that Turkey and it's not that nobody took note of it, but it hasn't been a significant issue of why these two countries would sign a mutual defense treaty all of a sudden out of the blue right before this chain event. So that brings me to the question, why haven't they done that prior to 2014? And why, despite this mutual defense treaty, mm -hmm. Turkey has not actually uh, joined the conflict militarily and claimed that it's trying to be neutral to the, both sides, given the fact that it does not have a mutual defense obligation with Russia, but it does with Ukraine. How does that work, legally speaking, given that they do have an obligation to provide um, uh, defense aid directly, not, not just selling weapons or contributing weapons, but actually come to the defense for the country? Uh, regarding the 2014 issues, uh, it's different from the current war because mm -hmm. Russia had taken Crimea and a part of the Donbass very quickly. Mm -hmm. It surprised everybody, almost everybody, including in Ukraine. And if it, nobody uh, knew what to do, at least on the short term. So as it surprised every, everybody, uh, Vladimir Putin was unfortunately very efficient uh, in this kind of blitzkrieg. So mm -hmm. that's why I think that that's the main reason why uh, nothing of similar to what is happening today uh, happened. Uh, because the threats of Russia against Ukraine dates back last year. So it's something that was less surprising than in 2014. Another reason, I'm sorry, I will say some uh, negative things about the current uh, US government policy. Uh, the thing is, uh, there is a list of um, contentious issues between Turkey and the United States since uh, 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the civil war in Syria, the United States government decided that it was absolutely a must to uh, use the PKK against Daesh, against ISIS, in spite of the fact that the US army has bombed and killed most of the leaders of ISIS in spite of the fact that the Turkish land army has inflicted severe defeat to ISIS. So it was completely unnecessary to use a terrorist group against another. And PKK is considered for variable reason by Turkey as an existential threat. This is a huge problem. That's why also uh, the Trump administration uh, attenuated a bit in giving an orange light to uh, Turkish operation against the PKK in Syria. It's not the case anymore. And another problem, which is more directly connected with uh, the current war, is uh, Russia had shot down, uh, Turkey had shot down a Russian uh, jet that had uh, briefly penetrated its airspace. And Turkey said, according to the NATO pact, we need assistance. We are not asking uh, Mr. Obama to nuke Moscow, of course, no, but we need the United States and all the other uh, members of NATO to say, we are with you. And the US official reaction was, it doesn't, it's not. Uh, the, the NATO pact is not applicable in this crisis. But it was another just very badly perceived in Turkey. I was in Turkey already at that time. And I can tell you uh, from the most various part of the Turkish public opinion, not only the supporters of Mr. Erdogan, it was considered as not respectful of the uh, signed treaties. So it, it also, uh, and Another problem, which is not only with the US, but to a large extent with Western Europe, was the failed coup of 2016. Mm -hmm. The only international leader who went to Turkey after the coup to uh, tell Mr. Erdogan, to tell the Turkish people, I am against this kind of method, was Vladimir Putin. No Western European leader, no uh, US president or vice president went to Turkey to say we are against uh, taking power by force. 
We are not anymore in 2016, 2017. The relation with the West is uh, much less bad than some years ago, but the problems are not all fixed. Uh, there are some efforts in the current uh, US administration to repair it, but they, are not they have not been sufficient until now, at least. Uh, because Turkey considers we have no guarantee that if we uh, help Ukraine more than that, uh, NATO will be with us. And I'm giving you another uh, example, even more recent example. Uh, Turkey has sold, as everybody knows, drones by Rektar, which are very efficient. But one year ago, the Ukraine government asked the US government to sell Patriot air defense. And until now, the US government has said no, even before Russia invaded Ukraine. So the common perception in Turkey, not only in the government circles, but including in the opposition circles, is to say, why we did more than you? And why do you ask us for even more? Uh, if you sell patriots to Ukraine, maybe we can think about so doing something more. But until now, we, we cannot trust, we cannot take as a guarantee that you will be with us if Russia becomes more threatening. Now, you bring up a very important point here because I don't think most people are aware about this approach to the US and attempt to sell, to buy the Patriot missiles. Because in, for the last few weeks, I've seen a lot of people blaming the Ukrainian administration for not preparing sufficiently for this mm. course of events. To my understanding, they've approached two sets of parties with the request for the type of defensive weapons that people are claiming that they don't have. They've approached Israel, which is working jointly with the US, rather they asked the US administration to lobby for the sale of that uh, over the Iron Dome. And they apparently separately and independently, they approached the US for its own uh, defensive weapon and were also denied that. Now, the logic of the, uh, you know, Israel is trying to play with both sides with Russia and Ukraine, but it's That's unclear true. to me why the US has not done that. And now it appears that the blame lies not on the Ukrainian government, which has attempted to take the appropriate steps to prepare itself for the war, but or any possibility of an attack, but by the US, which has not only that, that weapon, but took measures to hide the fact that it has denied the sale of that weapons, um, which you know remains an intriguing question. Why would they do that long before it has gotten to the point that Putin was threatening nukes and ended up in where he is now. Now it's a convenient excuse. We cannot do anything because then the whole NATO will have to get involved. But had they sold those weapons a year ago, Putin might have thought twice before even going that far. I agree. I agree. So getting back to Turkey, however, in the beginning of the of this conflict, Turkey has attempted not to apply the Montreal Convention and not to close the uh, the straits to Russia. But a few days later, we saw them change their mind. What exactly happened? What was was it a miscommunication in the beginning? Were they what what was the thinking in the Turkish circles? What what happened? None of that was made very clear to the media and uh, uh, different sources offer different interpretations. Uh, I am not part of the Turkish presidential administration, Ministry of Defense of any, any kind of public administration, so I am not the most appropriate person to reply to your question, but uh, seeing from outside, mm -hmm. uh, my uh, interpretation is Turkey wanted to be sure that Ukraine will not collapse in a week. Mm -hmm. uh, as many people, including in the West, including in the US, uh, feared a lot that Ukraine could collapse in some days. So after some days, it was obvious that the Ukraine army was very resilient, that most of the Ukrainian people was behind the Ukrainian president, and that the Russian offensive was very really poorly uh, prepared. So uh, it was not suicidal, it was not for nothing to close the streets to the Russian worship. There was, you know, after they made that decision, what what's unclear is the type of response coming in from a Russia towards Turkey, and actually it hasn't been very clear the the reaction of the international community. There's been so much going on that the reaction to this development has been relatively 
muted. What kind of response can we observe? What what has happened since they made that decision? Decision have the Russians attempted to uh, renegotiate it behind the scenes? And what can we expect in terms of this particular immediate current chain of events with that, in that regard? Uh, I would like to begin with an aspect that almost everybody has neglected. Uh, the main fear in Turkey, and one more time both among the supporters of Mr. Erdogan and among his opponents, uh, was not Russia invading Turkey, because Russia has a lot of, the, from the, even before the invasion, they, they knew that uh, Russia would face huge problems in attacking Turkey, so they knew it was not a credible scenario. Mm -hmm. But the fear was about retaliation in Syria. Mm -hmm. But precisely in blocking the uh, Russian warship from penetrating the straits. After some days, after Ukrainian army had proved to be resilient, after the United Union had proved to be uh, strong in its sanctions, it actually uh, created a lot of troubles for the Russian army in Syria. Because where can ship, Russian ships come from to which Syria? not from the Straits, they are closed, and not from Archangel, because we cannot expect Norway, uh, UK, and so on to allow uh, Russian warships to go to Syria and still is uh, Spain. So after they, Turkey understood that the West was uh, serious about sanctions, serious about reactions, that Ukraine was seriously uh, fighting, yes, it made sense to block the Straits, not only to help Ukraine, which is in itself a sufficient reason for Turkey, but also because it deprives Russia from its main way of retaliation against Turkey. And it is perfectly understood, I think, in Russia, because Russia did not react aggressively to this decision. Russia understands that the sanctions are devastating for Russian economy, that Russia will need some country which are against its invasion, but not uh, as uh, aggressive as uh, US or U U European Union are, otherwise the Russian economy will collapse even more quickly. So that's why Russia, uh, as far as I know, did not react uh, that much, or perhaps not even react at all. And I, I mean, it's simple, when you don't have way of retaliation, you don't say that much. I mean, uh, the regime of Vladimir Putin, it, uh, no matter how terrible or horrible it is, at least they have a certain understanding of the balance of power. They will not uh, hurl uh, completely empty threats nobody can take seriously. Now, this situation gives Turkey a great deal of leverage, particularly uh, in Syria, because Iran and its backing of Assad heavily depends on Russian military presence and support Absolutely. and the event that Russians start experiencing long-term logistical and other issues that also puts Iran under, under duress. How long do you think Turkey will be able to continue holding the Straits closed? What is the determination point where they feel that they have to reopen them? Is that until any concrete cessation of the uh, conflict Will they continue to keep it close if Russia does take over Ukraine and change the government? What is the scenario we're looking at from Turkish perspective? Um, you know, Jacques Chirac said the predictions are, diffic are difficult, especially when it is about future. <laughs> so uh, it was a joke, of course. Uh, so uh, I will not enter into real prediction because many, in many cases, even clever people uh, are wrong in their predictions. But uh, in the current situation, uh, we can look at the facts. Uh, the fact is that the Russian economy is collapsing quickly, that mm -hmm. the rubles has no value, is not convertible anymore, uh, that Russia has a backyard economy exporting uh, raw materials and importing electronics, which is, which is a reality. Uh, if European Union continues the sanction uh, until the sector of oil and gas, it will be the final blow to the Russian economy. So, and uh, also economically speaking, Iran's 
Until now, we will see if it changes, but until now, Iran is the second most sanctioned country in the world. Uh, Iran suffered a lot of the COVID crisis because the health system is not uh, efficient, to say the very least. So uh, one the two main way uh, Iran escaped the sanction were Russia and China. So if Russia is in collapse, uh, the Iranian economy will not recover quickly. That's what we may say for sure until now. So regarding more directly your question, for the moment, for the short term, I do not see uh, any serious possibility of Russia to put a puppet regime in Kiev because they did not take Kiev at all for the moment. All the attempts have failed. Uh, they are even taking some mercenaries from Black Africa. They are apparently taking some soldiers from uh, the uh, remains of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Oblast, mm -hmm. the small part that is under the Russian control. So uh, the Russian army needs fresh blood. And in spite of all its attempts, the Russian army has failed. So for the short term, I don't see any significant Russian success. Also. And another thing is uh, Ukraine is bigger than France. Ukraine has 44 million inhabitants. And Russia has something like 200,000 soldiers to invade it. So in any case, for the moment, it's completely insufficient to conquer Ukraine. And in any case, it's totally insufficient to dominate such a big country where an increasing part of the civilian population is armed. The more the war will continue, the more the number of Ukrainian civilians will aid Russians and will have an assault wife. So you, you cannot uh, dominate Texas uh, with 200,000 men. If, 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 you, if you understand the comparison. So uh, in any case, it is an extremely complicated situation for Russia, extremely difficult uh, situation for Russia. That's what we can see. And the more difficult the situation is for Russia, the, more, the easier it is for Turkey to maintain the streets close to Russian warships. That's what we can say for the moment. So we, we see Russia experience two problems. They came in expecting an easy victory and then going back to business as usual while exactly. uh, taking advantage of resources and, and probably putting in some tactical uh, nuclear weapons just to keep NATO from providing future assistance. Now they're not in that position. And they're facing problems in Syria, which is basically trying to fight a two front battle not a war because there's no you know hot action in syria at the moment but it's still a two-front situation where there's resources are stretched thin yes. how are they coping with that are they trying to bring in supplies and whatever else they need through the arctic w what's the plan to i one more time uh, the only persons who can give an accurate reply are in the kremlin <laughs> they have no part of that uh, but Seeing the problem externally, uh, we can already say that there was no serious plan to invade Ukraine, that uh, both in the documents which were seized by the Ukraine arm, Ukrainian army and by the testimonies of uh, Russian prisoners of war, we can be sure that the plan was Ukraine will, will collapse in 48 hours, at most in one week, we will not face any serious problem and uh, a puppet regime will be settled or it will, maybe it will be annexed uh, quickly. So uh, there was no plan B plan. There was no plan uh, in case of difficulties. They did not prepare the country ever economically, ever in military terms. So for the moment, we have no sign that they are preparing something serious to cope with the difficulties we have just discussed. That's a it very it may change, it may change, uh, we cannot know, but for, for the moment, they don't have an alternative. Uh, the geography, in a sense, is taking a kind of revenge. Mm -hmm. The geography of Russia prevents Russia from uh, doing uh, what Mr. Putin is trying to do right now. That's, that's quite a fascinating observation because, again, while people have made note that this whole development would make things difficult for Russia, what's not known is that they're still 
not only don't have any preparation for that eventuality, but as of now, they don't appear to be doing anything at all to remedy the, the current situation. Um, and I think that is worth noting in light of trying to see uh, the line of events. Pentagon the other day said it would be too high risk to develop, to bring in uh, Polish fighter jets by the US to deliver them to Ukraine. My opinion professionally is it's too high risk to allow Russia to operate and cause havoc with nuclear reactors and with the potentiality of greater destabilization and access to uranium, lithium, and so forth, especially when they are not so strong that they cannot uh, start a war with every country that de delivers some, some equipment. If that was the case, they would have already done so. Absolutely. Because we have already seen NATO members develop stingers and they had threatened to interpret that as a threat and, and so on, and nothing has happened since yes. the stingers, javelins, and so forth. So I don't see why Ukraine would necessarily do anything. I mean, Russia would necessarily do anything if uh, more, uh, if jets were also delivered. To me, it sounds I like agree. vested interest by some parties in a particular outcome, which they have no control over, but which they are still trying to indirectly instigate. You know, I don't want to be paranoid, but to me, that kind of seems to be what's, what's happening, unfortunately. I, I agree in the sense that uh, there is no variable reason to fear Russian retaliation in case of uh, plain agreement, in case of delivery of MiG, in exchange of delivery of F-16 uh, to Poland, for example. I, I don't think there is any uh, variable reason to fear uh, about that. That's true. It's, it, it's rather perplexing, but again, we have seen that from the very start of the process, failure to take in very minor, relatively speaking, defense steps by NATO members have allowed Russia, which was not strong to begin with, just to capitalize on this lack of political will rather than on anything else. And that's part of the reason why they weren't prepared. They were expecting everyone to fold very quickly based on this series of signals that we have seen in the past year. Yes, that's exactly. Exactly. It's not just about Ukraine falling, it's also of about reaction of NATO members, which was predictable judging by this failure to take defensive steps beforehand. And, uh, you know... And there is another factor we have not discussed yet, mm -hmm. uh, because it's not directly uh, connected to the Montreal Convention, actually. Um, it is a Western in the large, I mean, include Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, the Western public opinions. One of the reasons why the uh, European and even more the US government have taken the decision they have taken is the large majority of uh, Americans, uh, Europeans, uh, Japanese, and so on are vehemently against this invasion in the sense that it's not anymore about taking a small minority of a territory, it's about invading an independent country completely and uh, killing civilians if they resist and uh, putting a puppet regime at the head of the state. So this is something uh, perceived as an aggression, which is, which is an aggression, which is a major aggression, which is the most, uh, the, the worst thing uh, in a sense that so Soviet Union or Russia has done since the blockade of Berlin in 1948-1949. And the more Russia will be violent against uh, Ukrainian civilians, the more the Western public opinion will be against Russia. And that's also why I don't think uh, Russia will not use any kind of nuclear weapons, because if they do that, the Western public opinion will perhaps even ask for direct military intervention. On the First of all, if, if they even try uh, to start the process, which yes. I believe is probably the process strategically and how it works is probably known to intelligence agencies Absolutely. around the world. So Absolutely. long before it gets to the point of deployment of the nuclear warheads in any particular yes. direction, I think steps will be taken to disrupt the process in, and prevent it from happening. So Absolutely. I'm not sure where this political paranoia comes from when common sense and intelligence report dictates that the situation, while highly undesirable, is also not uncontrollable by yes. those who know who are charged with such matters. The, as far as I know, uh, it's necessary to have 
the green light of 10 Russian officers to use even one tactical nuclear weapons. 10. One, is, one, one veto of a middle rank officer is enough to uh, block it. And, and that's not even counting the political decision making process that is not strictly speaking the president's alone, even if he gives yes. the order, people can choose not to obey it. And Absolutely. He can try to get them arrested, but that still doesn't change the situation. And he would still need to find people to replace them who might also not be willing to do that. And it creates all sorts of complications. Absolutely. absolutely. And uh, Vladimir Putin is fully aware of the risk of a coup uh, against him uh, mm -hmm. because there is a growing, a growing uh, dissatisfaction inside the military and even more in the civilian population. So he knows that if he does that, he is increasing the risk to be uh, expelled from power, to be killed, maybe, uh, because officers will think uh, is uh, leading the country to an even bigger disaster if he does that. So I think it is extremely unlikely that he gives such an order. So basically, Putin has been able to get even as far as he did, which is not all that far all things considered, sh by sheer bluff, by... Yes. And, 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 and no one has been able to call him on that. And that is the weakness in democracies that Stalin had been, you know, uh, counting on until, of course, it didn't, because there is a red line even for everybody. So my question is, I wonder, what is finally that red line for Western states, for NATO, to see that Russia is not the threat and certainly not the immediate threat that everyone believes it to be unless they let it. And allowing Russia to operate with impunity is a far greater threat than taking action to prevent it from doing so. Complicated question. Uh, I will start in uh, reminding that Barack Obama had said there is a red line which is the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Mm -hmm. And we all know what happened. Russia used chemical weapons against children. Mm -hmm. The dead bodies of children were put on the front page of all the major Western newspapers, and nothing happened. So I'm not saying the situation is the same today for plenty of reasons, but it created a precedent that definitely incited Vladimir Putin to consider that the democracies are weak, mm -hmm. a bit like Stalin uh, in the 1940s. This is the uh, start. But today, the Western public opinion are much more against Russia than uh, some years ago, much more uh, aware of what is happening, much more concerned about what is happening. And it is also a leading factor in what the government consider to be a red line. And for example, the fact that there were such a level of protest against the uh, destruction of a pediatric hospital, which is no horrible war crime. I'm glad that there were such a reactions, but uh, something similar in Syria would have not provoked the same reaction and did not provoke the same reaction. So it incites to think that uh, no NATO members are more serious about red line in Ukraine than they were about Syria, which is, I think, a fact. To what extent exactly? I'm not sure. It's difficult to be sure, except if you are in the Ministry of Defense. And even in such a case, perhaps it's not enough. But in any case, as I said, uh, the Western government are more serious and uh, are, have uh, red lines. And it's even more difficult in the sense that nobody uh, may, not, I mean, literally nobody, I mean, two more warning. Maybe we will learn that Mr. Putin died of a heart crisis. Maybe to whom, maybe right now there are people who are preparing to poison his tea. But I don't, I, I'm not saying uh, I receive uh, any kind of data in this regard. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying the future is even more unpredictable than in other conflicts. There are so many factors, including inside Russia, that. Uh, we don't know, uh, we have real idea, we no idea how long the war will be. Uh, it may be, it may stop tomorrow if Mr. Putin is killed. It may start after some weeks, it may start after some months. 
uh, it will depend to a large extent to the situation inside Russia, actually. What you uh, in, 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 including, including, to return to your question, including uh, what the Russian army will use, what the Russian army will do. The Russian army is already doing what they did in Chechnya and Syria, to, put, uh, to be clear. Will they do even more? Will they do uh, that even more systematically uh, than during the last few weeks? Nobody can exclude this possibility. Uh, nobody can exclude that such uh, an increase of war crimes could provoke even uh, more severe sanctions, could provoke an ever quicker uh, collapse of the Russian economy, could provoke whatever we may imagine inside Russia. What is clear to me is that the more Russia depletes its own resources, the less of a threat it becomes to the international community. True. Not to undermine, not to diminish the suffering of civilians, uh, which could still be damaged by a great deal, but as a major power, as a threat, it, its capabilities are deteriorating over time, and it doesn't have the capacity to replace these capabilities with the speed that is necessary to maintain any sort of military superiority in the long run. And okay. I'm hoping that over time NATO will come to the conclusion that that period where Russia was, you know, the, the, the risk of escalation mm -hmm. outweighed the cost of getting involved, that that calculus will shift simply by logistical and logical uh, reasons, if nothing else. Well, thank you so much for this provocative and and very interesting discussion. I'll be sure to check out the book that you mentioned. And if there's any other reading material to that to these issues, please let me know. I'm really actually very fascinating to be this uh, post World War One diplomatic and history and correspondences and all these negotiations because they drive so much of the dynamic we're seeing today and people are not even aware of, they're not aware why russia is so adamant on certain actions that seem to make no sense in contemporary context and yet they harken back to all these um, grievances and historical uh, agendas that have never been disrupted absolutely thank you very much uh, Irina, thank you very much to all those who listened to our uh, podcast. podcast. Uh, I hope uh, it was helpful for them. Thank you so much. I am sure it was. And I look forward to speaking again soon. Have a nice afternoon. You too. It's a night for me. <laughs> good evening. Have a good one.